if you really get down to it, you could land like 99% of all the trout you catch without a reel. Reels are just fancy, extravagant, pretty line holders. All right, all right, I'm exaggerating. Reels are a tool to help us land fish a lot more quickly and effectively. But too often, especially for trout anglers, we end up buying a lot more reel than we actually need. On today's show, I'm going to walk you through exactly what type of reel you should be looking to buy as you begin fly fishing for trout. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. You know what? It's time to get real today. Get it because we're we're talking about fly reels. Yeah, I know I know y'all come here for the dad jokes, so don't act like you didn't laugh at that one, all right? <laughs> oh, I'm excited to be here. To talk about trout reels and we're gonna talk about a few other topics as well, like whether you can land two trout at once the best fly rod for a young boy, how to get started with tying your own flies, and then some tips for setting the hook on fish. That's all coming up later on in the show when we get to the Q&A section. But before we dive into this week's main topic, I do just want to remind everybody, episode 62 is coming up, and that is going to be our tying extravaganza with Alex. We're going to be together. We're going to talk all things fly tying and hopefully answer a lot of beginner questions folks have about getting started with tying their own flies. So you definitely do not want to miss episode 62. All right, with that out of the way, we'll get down to business. I'll I'll, I'll try to avoid any more real puns, but sometimes they just can't help themselves, all right, folks? I mean, a a pun has to be made, all right? I I, I don't make the universal laws. I just live by them. And one of those is that you got to make the pun when it's there. All right, well, today's show is mostly going to focus on the reel that you need for trout fishing, uh, but you can certainly extend this to bass to some extent and certainly to panfish as well. For fish like salmon or steelhead or pike and carp, the conversation about reels and what you need in a reel is completely different. So I want to make sure we're up front about that right at the get-go. This is a trout-focused reel episode uh and and really with trout fishing there seems to be two two main schools of thought and those would be two two main schools of thought when we go to buy or buy a fly reel and those would be that you either absolutely need a reel that is capable of stopping a freight train dead in its tracks all right you want a reel that can stop my mother-in-law from restraining me to moving to alaska because apparently she's really against that uh, <laughs> You need a reel that's that powerful that can stop freight trains and mothers-in-law. Uh, or you just need something that looks really pretty. It holds your line, and it's got a little bit of a drag that sounds nice, and it's capable of tiring a fish out, even if it takes a few minutes to do it. There's really not a lot of middle ground as far as the the type of trout reels that we see marketed and the type of trout reels that we see talked about. We either see the really high-end, super crazy drag or the really light, really pretty, aesthetically pleasing click Paul type reels. And we'll get into what click Paul and disc drag means here in a minute. So just bear with me on that terminology. But the problem arises here, especially for new anglers. What do you actually need? What is too much? What's not enough? What's the best bang for your buck? What features do you actually end up end up needing? And I wish I wish I'd had something like this when I started fly fishing because I went with super cheap reels for a really long time, and then I course corrected and went with really expensive reels for a long time, and now I'm kind of right there in the middle for most of my trout fishing, and I'll explain why I ended up there too as we get through this. So I promise I'm I'm setting the setting the table as it were right now, and we're we're gonna get into that, but. I've said before on this show that reels are just fancy line holders, and I've had had a few listeners uh, get a little bent out of shape with that sentiment. They do not disagree with me. Uh, There's a school of thought out there that you really should try to put every single fish 
within reason on the reel immediately so you can get that fish in more quickly. So you, you're a nymphing or you're dry fly fishing, you hook up, boom, put that fish on the reel, and you need to use the reel as an integral part of your fish fighting technique. And if you're not doing that, you're not playing fish correctly. That There is a school of thought out there that says that's what you've got to do. Now, I do agree with that to a point because all kidding aside and all my jokes about reels just being expensive line holders, a reel is a tool that will help you get trout in more quickly and more effectively. And especially where we're wanting to take care of the fish, the, the quicker we get them in the net and unhooked back in the water, the better off we are. Yes, we want to enjoy the fight, but you want to get them in without tiring them needlessly, right? So I, like I said, I agree with that to a point that we do need to get these, these fish in quickly, but that really gets to the heart of this whole issue, which is how much reel do you actually need? Well, I'm going to give you an example before I get into the actual specifics. I was fishing a couple, oh, probably about a month ago. It was before the deep freeze. And I think the whole country except Florida got, uh, experienced that deep freeze. So y'all, y'all know which deep freeze I'm talking about. It was my last I think it was probably my last day of winter fishing in 2023. I was out with a buddy, local creek here, and there's some big pools at the bottom of the local creek that usually don't ice up. I think they did when it hit negative 30 because, well, I mean, it was negative 30. Of course, they iced up, right? Well, I'm on these pools. They're open water, and I was throwing some really long drifts, and I had to get my nymphs down deep, so I had a lot of line out on the water because I had such a long drift, and I had to account for the time to get those nymphs down. So as a result of that, like I said, I had a ton of fly line on the water, a lot of slack out. Well, I hooked into a fish, and I kept tight to the fish. I, I, I managed my slack correctly, but I had a ton of line out. So I hook into the fish. And I'm tight to the fish, but I'm reeling in all my slack line really quick. So I've got my line uh, held tight against the cork of the fly rod with my finger. And then I'm reeling in all the slack line really, really quick. Uh, And I'm letting the fish take a little bit of line. I'm letting it slide through my finger. I'm using that as my break, uh, essentially. It's like my drag uh, while I'm reeling this fly line onto the reel. My drag is typically set pretty tight so that fish don't take much, if any, fly line from me. So once I got this rainbow, it was a nice, it was like a 15-inch rainbow. It was a pretty good fish, actually. I was surprised. But once that fish was tight to my fly line and I had all the fly line back on the reel, I was able to put more pressure on the fish. And then I ended up reeling and stripping a little bit to get it into the net. Boom, the fight was over. That's how I typically use my reel. And I think in like 99% of trout situations, that's probably what you are going to encounter. You're going to use a combination of stripping line in and putting it on the reel. It just depends on the situation, how much slack line you've got out versus how big the fish is versus the current speed that you've got to fight. There's a lot of variables that go into it, but most trout fishing situations, I think you're going to use some combination of stripping line in with your hands and reeling it in. So that's a typical fish, all right? Typical situation, that's how we're going to use our reel. But what about those big fish? Those ones that we kick ourselves for losing, that will keep us up at night, right? Uh, There's only a few things that keep me up at night. One of them is trying to figure out how the winget truck makes the wing sauce they do. I do not know what their secret ingredient is. The other thing is some of them big fish that I've lost. (laughs) That will certainly keep me up at night. So what do you do when you get that really big fish and they run off a whole ton of line? What do you do in that situation? Well, let's dial it back. Like, shoot, let's go back. I was new to, newer to fly fishing. I, for, for any new listeners, I grew up spin and fly fishing, grew up doing both. I love jig fishing. I jig fished a lot in high school, but... After high school, I kind of committed to the fly rod full time. And I w- this was shortly after I'd fully committed to the fly rod. I'm up in this, this little uh, tailwater fishing, and I hooked into a really nice rainbow. I don't know how big it was because I never saw him, but he was big. 
because he took me to backing on this stream, and it's not that big of a stream. He just shot upstream, and my problem wasn't actually the reel in that situation. It was a cheap reel, but the issue was how tight I had the drag set. I had the drag set super loose, and that fish was able to just run that off. And in that situation, with that big of a fish, no amount of really fancy reel, you, no, no amount of expensive reel is going to fix the problem of not having it set tight enough and then not using it effectively. So in that situation, I should have had the track set a lot tighter, and then I should have been using the reel and side pressure of the rod to try and put more pressure on the fish to keep it from running upstream. Or, and in that particular situation, what I could have done is I could have walked upstream after that fish and been reeling line in as I went, and that probably would have been the most effective way to do it. But again, the point I want to drive home is no amount of fancy reel was going to negate the fact that I had my drag set so loose that that fish was going to run all that line off anyways. And it ran it off, and then it shook its head and broke my fly off. So I never even got to see how big it was. I'm assuming it was like 37 inches long at least. But who knows? Who, who can tell? Like I, I, There's no way to tell, right? So I, I tell you these two stories to illustrate the typical use cases for a trout for reels when you're trout fishing and what you should be looking for that reel to do. You're looking for it to add some stopping power. You're looking for it to add some leverage. You're looking for it to help manage your line. Those are the three things because you don't need to put a 10 inch trout on the reel. You, you, uh, well, okay. Let, let me back that up. You don't usually need to put a 10 inch trout on the reel. Sometimes if it gets into heavy current, you might have to, but there are very few instances where you need to put a 10 inch trout on the reel. You just hand strip that in, reel the slack up and, and call it a day. Now, 15 inch trout, different story. You're probably going to need to put that on the reel. Again, what you need out of your trout reel though, is the ability to help slow those fish down. And the reels, they provide a hard stop to keep trout from running. They provide a mechanism by which we can, like I've said, either through stripping or reeling, get fish to the net quickly. But there has to be some sort of resistance, and the key is smooth resistance. Uh, the best reels have very little startup inertia. That's the, the little hitch that you feel when line gets pulled off the spool before your drag kicks in to slow that spool down. But the problem is the reels that have almost no startup inertia are really, really expensive because of how precise the machining needs to be in order to achieve that. And, I mean, that really comes into play with big fish and fine tippets. For a lot of trout fishing, you're going to be fine, even if there is a little bit of startup inertia, even if it's not the smoothest pickup, you're going to be okay. Now, Talked about use cases, how I use my reel, how I see them being used, how I think beginners should use them. Again, I, I know I'm being repetitive, but I'm being repetitive because I want to be really clear with my point here so I'm not misunderstood. Yes, we do need to use reels, but they're not the only way to get a fish in. They are part of the toolbox. Stripping line and rod angles and then your, your reel, the, all three of those work in tandem to help you put fish in the net. And we've actually done an episode, I'll, I'll try and link it in the podcast description, all about fighting fish and rod angles and what those rod angles do. So you can go listen to that uh, if you want more information about, you know, how to, how to fight and land fish. But really, at the end of the day, for the vast majority of trout fishing, there are three things that your reel needs to have, three criteria it needs to meet. And criteria number one is that it's got to be light and it can either be machined or cast aluminum depending on how it was made light is kind of a relative term as well but you what you're looking for is a reel that will balance your rod i would look for something in the five ounce range that's a really good weight to cost ratio when you look at reels that weigh about five ounces versus how much they cost you're going to get a good reel if, if you're looking about that five ounce range uh, and that five ounce range, once you put your fly line and backing on there, that's going to balance most of your nine foot five weights 
really well and it's not going to break the bank. You want it balanced because it just makes a smoother casting experience for you at the end of the day. Uh, it's a little bit easier to high stick and feel the uh, the subtle takes if, you're, if your rod and reel are balanced well. So, uh, and you'll also see, I mentioned whether or not a reel was machined or cast. Um, I'll get to that in the durability part a little bit, but that's just the two different ways that you can make a reel. You can either get a big block of aluminum and machine the reel out of that, or you have a form that you pour uh, some sort of aluminum alloy or other other metal into, and you cast it in a reel or in a form. Pardon me, like that. And it, at this point, cast reels they, they tend to be heavier, but the technology there is improving as such that you can find really good cast reels that are in that five ounce range, and they're they're going to work. They're going to work just fine. So make sure it's light. Second criteria your reel's got to meet is the drag needs to be decent. Well, what do I mean by decent? Well, you want a disc drag, and here I am talking about drags like I promised I would. There's two main types of drags. You've got a click pawl, which is really just a, a little piece of metal that provides resistance against the spool as the spool moves around. And some click pawl reels have slightly adjustable springs that can increase the pressure on that piece of metal, but most of them don't. It's a set amount of pressure. You can't change it. You can't increase or decrease it. It's just set. Uh, Click pawl reels are great because they're usually a lot lighter. They sound really pretty, but again, they only provide one drag setting, so you can't tweak them. Uh, You can't up the resistance if you get into bigger fish. They're really ideal for small streams, small fish setups, something you'd take to catch like 7 to 10 inch brookies all day. That, that's where your click ball reel comes into, in, into play. Now, a disc drag reel works by squeezing uh, discs of different material together to create friction that slows down the spool. And that is what you're really looking for for a trout reel. Some companies are going to try and sell you on their fancy disc drag systems with like Ruan and stainless steel and all these other composites and whatnot. And yes, it makes a difference. I'm not going to say it doesn't, but for the average trout angler, you don't need, you don't need the latest and greatest. You don't need a reel. that's basically a size down tarpon reel. Uh, I've seen some, some folks end up with that and that's just, that's overkill. In fact, one of my favorite trout reels that's landed everything from smaller rainbows to really large brown trout exerts about four pounds of drag, and it's got like a stainless steel dish drag, I think, is what's in it. Uh, I think that's the sweet spot to aim for. Look for reels that produce about four pounds worth of drag. Not all reel companies will post the amount of pounds their reels exert, but from my understanding, research I've done and folks I've talked to in the industry, that's a pretty common amount of resistance in trout reels is that four pounds. So you're going to want to look for that. And again, you want a dish drag reel uh, that exerts about four pounds. Don't worry if it's not the latest and greatest material in that dish drag. You just want to make sure it's a dish drag reel to begin with. And then the last thing is you do want to make sure that reel is durable because they're going to take a beating when you drop your fly rods like me. Uh, your reel is going to hit first, and you're going to ding it up, and y- you don't want something that you got for cheap off eBay or Amazon. Uh, some of those might be good, but like I said, reels take abuse, and the last thing you want is a reel that's so weakly constructed that it bends or breaks because then you're really in a bind on the water. You want something that's cast or machined aluminum. That that should be your uh that should be your criteria. Uh, it's worth the extra money to have that durability. I promise. I've actually, I, I had a real bend on me once. The frame bent when I dropped it. And I actually had to quit fishing during a good blue wing hatch because I couldn't get the spool back on. And the fish were, it, the fish were large enough that I really did need a reel. And I had, I had all of this extra line. There was no way to hold the line on either. I couldn't get the spool on. So it was just a giant mess. I had to quit fishing because I dropped the reel and bent the frame. And that was one of the cheapest uh, reels that I'd ever used. So I I would caution to avoid that. I think you can find a really decent reel. (laughs) See what I did there? A really decent reel. 
for like a hundred bucks. And that's in the grand scheme of things, that's not too much money. And that reel is going to take care of 99% of trout fishing that happens. So like I said, all kidding aside, reels are important tools, but especially for beginners, you do not need to overextend yourself and buy something super fancy. Find something that meets the criteria I listed here. And I think you're going to be in great shape. Now, if you guys are ready for this, we've got the Q&A portion of this week's show coming up. So grab your diet coat, get comfortable, kick back, and get ready for some great questions from some great anglers. If you're new to the show this week, uh, first off, welcome. Second, we do a Q&A section every week on the show where I answer questions submitted directly from the audience. So please, if you have a question that you would like answered by me, wing expert, connoisseur, diet Coke enthusiast, which by the way, to the Coca-Cola executives who I'm sure are watching this show, um, I'm eagerly awaiting the sponsorship agreement. So let's, uh, let's get cracking on that, please. Anyways, if you got a question about fly fishing, you like answered, there's always a link in the podcast description. You can drop us a line there, and I'd be more than happy to answer it. You can also get a hold of us via Carrier Pigeon and the Pony Express. Smoke signals do not work uh, when it's this cold. The smoke just kind of freezes. So I, I know it's unfortunate, isn't it? <laughs> oh, all right. Well, we do have some great questions to talk about this week. And the first one comes to us. Rick from Iowa writes in and says, Love the show and your tips and advice. While fishing with a, a drop fly rig and a hair's ear, so a dry dropper, it seems like, uh, the light came on and I caught over 10 fish in less than an hour. My question, what do you do in case you get two fish on at once while fishing uh, with a dry dropper or a bounce rig? Will your five weight be able to handle it or will I be disappointed? Well, Rick, that's a fun question. Thanks for sending that in. Uh, really, it just depends on what the fish decide to do. Uh, you, you're at their mercy at that point. Your five weight fly rod will 100% be fine with that. Your five weight line is going to be fine with that. I mean, unless you hook like two 30 inch fish, which if you hook two 30 inch fish on, on a dry dropper rig or on a double nymph rig, please talk to me. Cause I would love to go fishing with you. <laughs> All right. Cause you got some, you got some good mojo that I need. Uh, <laughs> I need part of. All right. Uh, really. You know, I, I've probably had this happen like a dozen times to me, maybe, where you've got one fish on the dry and another on the dropper, or you've got a fish that took both of your nymphs. Uh, it happens with smaller fish more often, I've found, especially up in the high country, because they get so hungry, they'll throw themselves at just about anything, kind of like me at a buffet. Man, don't let me near a buffet. Uh, you're not going anywhere for two hours minimum if you're at a buffet with me. All right. Anyways, uh, all, all you really can do in that situation, Rick, is just try and play and land it like you would if it was a single fish. Uh, there's really not much else you can do except appreciate the rarity of that happening. And like I said, your five weight's going to be able to handle that just fine. Wouldn't worry about it. And I, I really even wouldn't worry about it all the way down to a two weight. I mean, uh, you know, maybe a two weight. I, I don't know. But e even then, I think you're going to be fine. Your line's going to snap before anything happens to your rod or your fly line. I'm, your tippet your tippet, and your leader are going to snap before anything happens to your fly line, I mean, or your rod in that case. So, uh, interesting question. Fun one. Thanks a bunch, Rick. Appreciate you sending that one on in. Ethan from Colorado has got our next question, and he says, I am getting into fly tying, and I already have my tools and vice. Looking at the materials to make my first fly, the Wooly Bugger, I saw the price of $46. My goal is to eventually make a fly tying company once I'm good enough at tying. Is there any materials that you could recommend that are cheaper? Also, you make moving wood more enjoyable, tight lines. Hey, Ethan, great question, and I'm assuming moving wood is your job, and you listen to me while you're moving wood. Hopefully, uh, that's the case. Otherwise, and there's some interesting things going on there. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> my advice to you uh, and my advice to everybody listening here is to look at fly tying as an investment. You say you want to make a fly tying company, and that's great if you want to get to the point where you can tie some flies. 
and sell them to folks locally. But you are going to have to invest in that, and part of that investment is materials. Plus, for that 46 bucks you mentioned, you probably are going to get three to four dozen woolly buggers once you know what you're doing. And you could sell those for a bit, buy some more materials, keep tying. You likely see where I'm going with this. But the important thing for anyone who's looking to get into fly tying, regardless of whether you want to sell your flies or not, is that you have to understand it is an investment. It's a lot of money up front, but it it, it pays off if it's something that you enjoy. And Alex actually has an entire episode in our fly tying masterclass about whether you save money by tying your own flies versus buying them. And I'll link that in the podcast description for y'all to look at. Uh, I really like Alex's take on the subject. Uh, But just to reassure anybody who's maybe like on the fence about getting into tying and you're really worried about that upfront cost and you're like, whoa, am I really going to get my money back? Is it really worth it? Well, I have a couple of saddle hackles and these are, those are what we use for tying dry flies. And I bought those like five years ago because they were on sale. Uh, I got them for 60 bucks each, 120 bucks. I got two saddle hackles and I am still tying flies off both of those. Although I am about at the end of the life on each of them. So that was five years ago. Like I said, I paid 60 bucks, 60 bucks each, 120 total. And I've probably tied a few hundred flies from each of those saddles. The materials go a lot longer than you expect. So while the initial investment is high, you really can make your money stretch and work for you. Um, I wouldn't be too deterred by it. Plus, at the end of the day, I mean, there might be a difference of 50 cents in materials from one place to another. Um, I'm really not sure. It's been a long time since I shopped for my for my own materials. It's probably not true. There's probably a bigger price discrepancy than that. But I mean, shop around, buy from your local fly shops. That's going to help you out. We've also got fly tying kits here that we sell where you can tie. We, we send you enough materials to tie a baker's dozen of them. And that's actually a pretty solid deal. So you get enough material to tie 13 flies at least, usually a few more than that. And that that's a really solid deal to jump on. So if you're interested in tying flies, uh, I'll link those in the podcast description as well. But thanks, Ethan. Thank you, Ethan, for sending that question on in. Philip from Pennsylvania writes in when the next question says, what is a great fly rod for a 13-year-old boy? I don't have a preferred company or anything. Thank you. Well, Philip, a fly flinger from Ventures Fly Co. Go buy one. They're they're freaking fantastic, man. <laughs> uh, no, they're they're actually really good. They're one of my favorite beginner rods I've ever used. Uh, I I fished with the fly flinger and liked it before I ever joined the team here at Ventures Fly Co. So my opinion of it is not tainted by the fact that I now work for Ventures. So it's um. It, it, it's a really it's a really solid rod. I I love that it's a nice medium fast action. You can feel the line load. I think it's a lot better for beginners to learn on a medium fast rod than a really fast rod because they're able to feel the feedback from the line during the cast. It helps improve casting mechanics, and especially for a thirteen year old boy, this is a rod that you know. Wouldn't be afraid to take it out and beat it up a little bit. Those scuff marks add beauty to a fly rod anyways. Unless it's like one of them real pricey bamboo ones, then, you know, no scuff marks, please, at all on those ones. <laughs> um. Uh. Anyways, it is a really solid beginner rod. Uh, it's very similar in action to the Douglas LRS, if anybody's fished that rod. Uh, and it's certainly slower than the Orvis Clearwater. Uh, the clear water is a solid rod, but it's pretty fast. And our our rod's a little bit slower. Well, not a little bit. Our rod's noticeably slower than the clear water. And I'm I'm not knocking the clear water at all. Decent rod. Uh, but I, I prefer the fly flinger. And I preferred it, uh, like I said, well before I started working for Ventures. So uh, we did actually just update. Or we're in the process of updating. They will be here soon. The fly flinger. It is going to look new. It is, we've taken, we've taken the rod and we've turned it into a sleeker, sexier fish catching machine. 
all right? It's the same blank. We just updated the looks, <laughs> so so don't worry, all right? Uh, it's the same rod. We just made it look a little fancier, uh, but I'll, I'll link that in the podcast description so you can go take a look at that, Philip. I uh, appreciate you sending that question in. Dave from Colorado wrote in, and in our little form, it asked you where you're from, and he put Colorado, and then in parentheses, I know, I know. So I'll try to refrain from any Colorado jokes while answering your question, uh, David. (laughs) Oh, but your question, he writes in, he says, Hi, Spencer, I've been fishing for a long time, but I am new to fly fishing. This is my first year giving it a shot, and I'm already hooked, pun intended. I've already learned a lot from this podcast, but I'm hoping you can help me with a question I have. I just got back from a fun but frustrating day on the river. I caught a couple fish, but I missed a lot more. I was fishing Clear Creek just outside of Golden, Colorado, using a chubby Chernobyl with a zebra midge as a dropper. I had lots of hits on the chubby, but it almost seemed like the fish weren't fully eating it because I kept missing them. I set the hook quickly, slowly, hard, and soft, but I couldn't get a hook set to save my life. I must have had 20 hits that I missed. The trout in this stretch are relatively small, so I thought I would tie on a smaller dry fly, but I was only really getting consistent hits with a size 10, chubby Chernobyl. If I caught all these fish, I would have had my best day yet by a long shot, so please help me understand what I'm doing wrong. My current theory is that I simply wasn't wearing enough tweed. Thanks, and keep doing what you're doing. Well, David, you 100% weren't wearing enough tweed. You answered your own question, so we wrap the show up here. We're done. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. See you next week. Tight lines. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) There's more to it than that. Uh, I really love that joke, though, David. I showed that to everybody at Ventures, and we all busted up. That That was fantastic. So thank you for the joke about the tweed. All right, kidding aside, I I think the issue here, aside from what you've already described, is that the fish really were just too small to get their mouths around that fly. And that unfortunately happens sometimes where the only thing that they'll rise to is something big because it's a big ticket meal item. So, of course, they're going to move for something like that. But with you missing that many fish, I'd also have to say there's probably an issue with your hook set, I'm not, I'm not sitting here like, oh, David, this is all your fault. Now you better, you better, you, you better sharpen up that hook set, young man, or else you're going to be just in, in trouble. You're never going to catch fish. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming down on you like that, but I'm, if, if it's that many fish that you missed, there, there is a chance that you're doing something incorrectly. And, and there's a chance that there's a place for you to improve. Sometimes, especially if they're smaller, uh, and they're, they're coming up and they're smacking that fly, you've got to let the fish, like, take the fly itself, N- not really even set the hook. You, If you can, let the fish take the fly completely beneath the water before setting the hook. And then at that point, you mentioned you tried varying your hook set. I've found with these small fish uh, and the bigger flies, your best bet is just, keep the line tight against the cork of your fly rod so you've got almost a complete tight line between you and your dry fly and then just lift not sharp not sudden just smooth almost like you're casting but just lift like you're going to cast the rod again and usually that'll help so that's one way you can do it um i also would have sized down to like a size 12 chubby or even a size 12 stimulator maybe something that had a wider hook gap uh because chances are they were reacting to the silhouette of that fly on the water. They were reacting to its shape and size. So you could step down to a size 12. Uh, you said the size 10 was getting a lot of hits. And you went to a smaller dry fly, but you didn't mention what size. So maybe the issue was you should have gone down to a size 12 and kept that chubby. Uh, and you would you would have caught some more fish there. Uh, I think a smaller version probably would have helped you out quite a bit uh, in that instance. I would also think about switching out your dropper in that instance for something larger. If you've got a size 10 uh, chubby on, you can put on a pretty big dropper. Uh, Pat's Rubber Legs is one of my favorites. A Utah Killer Bugs, another great one that would work well in this situation because both of those are bigger, larger nymphs that might get the attention of those fish uh, in a more effective way than that smaller zebra midge might have. So hopefully those tips help you out, David. And again... Uh, you know, maybe if you take all of those tips and you put more tweed on when you're on the river, then you'll really have it dialed in that. 
That would be what I would suggest you do. But no, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to send that one in, David. And with that, folks, we are at the end of yet another episode of Untangled. Appreciate you all taking the time to listen to me yammer on about fly fishing. I love doing it. I can't believe this is 60 episodes. I, I, I've talked about this 60 times. This is crazy, but it's wonderful. It's a good kind of crazy, and I'm stoked to be doing it. Remember, if you have any questions about fly fishing that you would like answered, please submit those. This show runs off of your questions. Everything we do here is based around stuff you want to hear and learn about. My monologues at the beginning of the show are all based around questions that I get from listeners and viewers of the show. So we need your questions to keep this thing going. Always a link to the podcast description. Click on it. Take a look at everything else in the podcast description as well. Please rate and subscribe wherever you listen to this. That helps us more than you will ever know. And until next week, everybody, get out on the water and tie lines.